And in, so in particular, uh, so I'd like to talk about Julia, the programming language, and in particular, I'd like to talk about what, it, what we think it brings to uh, the machine learning world and the things that we're excited about within that that we're developing at the moment. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, how many people have heard of Julia already? OK, that's, that's pretty amazing, actually. Um, is anyone here using it regularly or has used it in anger particularly? OK, a few hands, uh, less. But that's good, because you have something to learn. Uh, like in there. So yeah, we've had a bunch of really great talks uh, today, and we'll have more tomorrow on applications of machine learning. Uh, I think my laptop's gone to sleep. So yeah, lots of talks on applications, uh, all of which is very cool. Um, if you're like me, then you might want to take a step back and kind of think that, about the tooling that enables these things, right? Uh, people are able to work much faster and easier uh, than they could in the past. They're able to scale up to much bigger problems and more complex things, um, especially without having like any particular knowledge. You know, you don't need to be a GPU programmer anymore to make effective use of neural nets or machine learning, uh, which is a great thing. And partly that's because of breakthroughs in technology. Partly it's actually because the tooling has improved so much over the course of 10 years or so. Um, and so machine learning in particular are at a point where you can kind of just pick a framework and uh, solve your problem. And then you're kind of, you're, you're going, right? You're rolling. Um, but so actually, I want to talk about the existing frameworks uh, for a moment before I start talking about Julia. Has anyone noticed that there are quite a lot of these things? Yeah. Uh, every couple of weeks, there's a new one on Hacker News, right? So uh, out of curiosity, I. Uh, I actually like, spent an hour compiling a list of all of these things that I could find anyway. Uh, and this is how it comes out. Uh, there are a few. Um, and you can see the, uh, the more well-known ones on the left, TensorFlow, MXNet, Torch, that kind of thing. Some less well-known ones. All the big players are here, Intel, NVIDIA, even Amazon. I think my favorite one is uh, this one right here, the GNU Gnural Network. Um, everyone has one of these things, right? You have to. Um, so yeah, and uh, by this point, you're probably expecting me to say something like, uh, Julia has an even better one of these, right? Um, and you might be thinking, of this XCD, KCD, there's always a relevant one, right? We have a new one. We have a new standard, which is going to come on to everyone's use cases. So, and this is kind of how people view the situation, right? People view it as a problem that there are so many of these things. And for good reason, right? It's a lot of duplication of effort. Um, and it's a new API to learn when you want to move around. So uh, but I kind of want to examine that and break it down. Is it a problem? Uh, can we have, like, can we not just invest our effort in TensorFlow, for example, and make that really brilliant and not have to worry about the problem ever again, right? The problem is that each of these frameworks does different things well. Uh, that's the core issue. Um, so Gene earlier on talked about PyTorch uh, compared to things like TensorFlow and Keras. And that's a great example uh, that I have here. So we have, for example, data flow based uh, libraries like TensorFlow, which require you to specify the whole computation graph. And once you've got that, you can distribute it over multiple machines. You can parallelize. You can deploy to a smaller embedded environment. Um, you can apply all kinds of memory optimizations. That's all really great. But having to know the graph in, in advance might be an issue. Uh, you might want to do some different computation based on the data, which you can't do so easily in TensorFlow. Uh, or you might want to do things like random gradients uh, in a custom way for reinforcement learning. That kind of thing is harder in TensorFlow. Then you have PyTorch, right? PyTorch addresses all of those problems. You're just writing Python code, and it differentiates for you. That's amazing because you can do, uh, you know, write whatever code you want for your network. You can do all the control flow you want and for loops and so on. But then you have this thing of struggling with optimization. And I can tell you, who's, as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about how to implement these things, this is quite a fundamental trade-off. It's nowhere near as simple as just saying, hey, let's just add these features to PyTorch, or let's just add these features to TensorFlow. This is hard to do. So it's actually a good thing in that sense that people are making all these libraries to explore the design space. There's so many different ways of doing this thing, solving this tooling problem. Uh, each of which fits a different approach and use case. So we kind of want to know, uh, explore that space, and uh, figure out what the, what the good solutions are within that. So that's a good thing. The problem then is that these things are also separate. Everyone is an island, right? If you're working with TensorFlow, 
you can't say, oh, let me play around with PyTorch. You have to relearn the entire API. Uh, you have to rewrite your whole model. Um, and this is not using the best tool for the job, right? If you're a data scientist, you will have worked with R probably because it's great for stats, but it's not something you use to write a web server. Instead, you write a web server in Python, and maybe you have those two things communicating. Or Python's great for many things, but it's not good for embedded systems, so you'd use another language like C for that. Uh, we make trade-offs and we combine these things in different ways. That's what we're not able to do right now in the, in the machine learning world. And so you have problems. You have duplication of effort within the libraries themselves. Uh, you have problems as you kind of go outside the bounds of a given framework and you find that you're working on problems that aren't exactly the kind of th things Google or Facebook is working on. Um, that's quite likely because you're not Google or Facebook, right? Probably. Um, and a simple example of this, uh, and probably one that will resonate with a few of you, is uh, having data in weird formats, right? So imagine this kind of thing. TensorFlow has, and various of these frameworks have readers for various data formats are written in C, or you have you know, Python, uh, Pandas CSV reader, which is really amazing and fast. Then you get some weird binary blob, or you get some data which is some weird text format that you have to pass yourself. Suddenly you have to write this in Soy Python, or you have to rewrite in C, and you have, uh, and that's just a huge amount of effort to solve that kind of problem. So with that in mind, uh, I will start talking about Julia. So um, I could go into a lot of depth about the features Julia has and the kind of the things it's able to do, um, but I kind of want to skip that and just show you some of the implications of it at a higher level way. I think that's more interesting. And there are a lot of tutorials and things online if you want to know more about this. The gist of it you can get from this image. It is a uh, very high level Python-like or Ruby-like language. Um, the key thing about Julia is that we're able to take this code, code like this, and make it very, very, very fast. So for example, this function, you can, in the REPL, you can say to Julia, please give me the LLVM code that you're generating for this. And you get something like that. And it's not, it doesn't matter too much if you can't read this. But the point is, this is 10 or so machine code instructions. Um, <laughs> And for various reasons, it's very difficult to do this kind of thing in other languages. So in Python, for example, even for a simple function like plus, you have to say uh, a plus b, well, is, is a dot r plus overloaded? Is b dot r plus overloaded? Is there a method hook somewhere? Um, even if you get rid of the interpreter, you still have to do those things, because if you don't, you change the meaning of the program. Uh, Julia is designed to avoid some of those pitfalls. It's designed for performance from the get-go, and so we can get this kind of really tight machine code. Um, and in doing so, we kind of break apart the barrier between uh, the high-level libraries that you're working with and the low-level machine code that's running. Um, and this starts to show us how we might solve our problem of you know, having to implement something custom. You no longer have to do that rewriting in C to get that. Uh, breaking down this barrier it actually applies in more than one case. So we can uh, have a lot of flexibility to do what we want with Julia code and to compile it in interesting ways. So there's a cool library out there called CUDA native.jl, uh, which uh, actually runs Julia code on GPUs. So this is a GPU kernel written in Julia, which can be used to element-wise add two vectors. Um, most of the time, you almost certainly won't need to do something like this. But the point is that you can always drop down to the lowest level and see what's going on. right? Most of you, of course, will want to work with some higher level abstraction. So we should, for example, we use a few of these kernels. We build up matrix multiplication and addition, broadcasting operations, that kind of thing. And then we put those in a library, and you have libraries for GPU arrays. Um, and you can build other libraries for things like auto differentiation and things like that. So one thing we notice in libraries uh, in languages where you have to write code in C and then wrap it is you tend to kind of end up conglomerating everything together. Everything has to communicate at the C level, and then you build the wrapper of the language on top of that. Um, because otherwise, you get performance hit at the language barrier. Because in Julia, there is no language barrier, uh, we find that more things can be spit out into libraries. Um, so in this case, we have a GPU array library. In fact, we have several of them, um, each with their own features, some of the wrappers for other libraries, and so on. We also have a few uh, auto differentiation libraries. These all will mix and match, right? You can grab these and you can try one, try the other, and feel around for what's working, what isn't. Uh, we already have six combinations of possible you know, trade-offs we can make here, but we don't need six deep learning libraries to, to handle that and to explore that trade-off space. 
Uh, furthermore, further to that, then once we've kind of have these basic low level tools, we can start building up. And you can see how we start to build up higher abstractions on top of this. So for example, uh, here we define a Julia object called a type. Um, and we define a forward and backward pass for that type, just written in Julia code using those GPU array abstractions. Um, this is a very, very generic interface for a machine learning model, which is forward, backward pass, right? And we have optimizers that will work with this generic interface. So you can fulfill that interface uh, with straight Julia code, or with a custom GPU kernel, or with TensorFlow, or whatever you want, right? And it will all mix and match again. So obviously, uh, in this case, like we don't always want to write this kind of low-level code. We want to write, write high-level kind of mathematical code and have the compiler work out that that should be done in place and so on, things like that. So building further and further on top of that, we have this library called Flux, which basically allows you to uh, treat Julia functions written not, you know, as normal Julia functions, element-wise, multiply, that kind of thing, um, and treat them as data flow graphs, which allows us to do things like differentiation and even things like compiling that function to TensorFlow or to other libraries to run that function on GPUs and so on. And then we can, you can see that this does, uh, supports both a forward and backward pass. So this is already something we can use as a layer in one of our models. Um, and that's kind of very straightforward. This probably looks at the moment a lot like building a graph in TensorFlow as you would in Python. Uh, there are actually some quite significant differences and I'll show you more of those in the demos I have later on. So once we have all of those pieces, it's just the case of chaining together some layers, right? And now we have a model which can do something like recognizing MNIST digits. Um, this looks very Keras-like uh, and it's designed to be that way, of course, because Keras has a great interface with these things and it's very simple. Um, the difference is that it's more flexible. We can replace parts of this. This is all built up in Julia, which means that um, you can work with your own abstractions for doing this kind of thing if that's what you want. Um, no, it's all kind of transparent the whole way down. And mixing and matching it all together. So when you want to fulfill your particular use case, you can do that by picking the parts that you want and throwing away anything you don't want. And in fact, we have an example here where we chained together an affine layer that we converted to TensorFlow within the MaxNet layer, converted to a MaxNet, another library like TensorFlow, uh, and SoftMax, which is just a Julia function. And this is something that we can go ahead and run a training process on. Uh, it's not necessarily something you'd want to do, uh, but it kind of illustrates how easy it is to mix and match different approaches. You could have a more PyTorch-like library in Julia and integrate it with this, get optimizers for free, uh, and kind of play around with those different things. Yeah, so that's the uh, so that's the core of that. It's about that kind of flexibility and being able to kind of build whatever you want on top of what's there. Uh, we don't really want to have any black boxes. Uh, we want you to be able to dig into any layer of it and say, okay, what's what's going on here? Can I tweak it? Can I change it? Um, meanwhile, of course, you can use the best of breed stuff. You can use TensorFlow if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so yeah. Uh, Oh, and so uh, another thing I mentioned, so uh, what, we, what we tend to find in the Julia community is that uh, we'll have people who start using the language, uh, and a month later, they might be uh, submitting patches to like packages or to the core uh, language on the GitHub repo and things like that, and implementing strange new kinds of arrays, like bit arrays and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's not really something you ever find in uh, an ecosystem like Python's. Um, Although it has a huge number of great developers, uh, you tend to, you, knowing Python isn't enough to develop Python because Python, NumPy and Python itself and so on are not written in Python. Uh, because Julia is written in Julia, uh, there's such a, grad, like, such a smooth transition from uh, user to developer, um, which has been a great thing for our ecosystem so far. So I want to tell you a bit more about Flux and the work we've done there, so I'll load up those demos. I'm just going to grab some water. Is this kind of readable? So this uh, illustrates, uh, this, by the way, is uh, our IDE. It's called Juno. Um, and the idea with the IDE was that we kind of really like the tools like uh, Jupyter, which allow you to do a very sort of interactive data analysis. 
uh, in a very intuitive way and uh, let you visualize things and plot and so on. Um, but we wanted something that was more tuned to kind of developing code as well as just doing a data analysis. So this is an IDE which has many kind of Jupyter inspired features uh, like, you know, like plotting support and so on. But also you can work with files and it's built on top of Atom so it's a great text editor. Uh, and we've done a lot of work of Atom in, on Atom in the process of building this. So uh, we have a fairly standard console. Uh, we can type 2 plus 2 and get 4. Uh, we sometimes find we have to wait for the compiler to run a bit uh, the first time, but then after that will be uh, very quick. Um, we can do things like create a random array of fives, uh, sorry, random, random array of length five, uh, and that's some data that we can look at and browse through. Um, we can also evaluate in the editor, so that's where the kind of Jupyter-inspired stuff comes in. Uh, we have a source code file here, and we can just kind of step through it. So I'm going to load some data. Uh, I'm going to split it into a training set and a test set. It uh, might struggle a bit while it's uh, trying to display on two monitors because it's quite an old laptop. Hopefully it will uh, load up. Um, and so you can see, again, like this is very, yeah, Keras-like code. It's basically the same thing I had up before. Uh, we're writing this thing in terms of the... Uh, uh, chaining some layers together. Um, so what's interesting about this uh, is uh, less kind of the, uh, the affine, like the, the stacking of layers thing in itself, but in fact the, uh, the way that's implemented. So I can actually drop into the, um, the library here and I can say, okay, look, let's look at fluxes of fine layers and we can see it's defined in this very simple, it's just a logistic regression. So we have a weight matrix and a bias um, and it's X times W plus B, right? So, oh, this is loaded up now. So you can see we're able to just browse through these uh, arrays. So these, uh, the data I've loaded up here is MNIST digits, uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but in case you're not, they look like this. Each one of these digits is represented as an array of numbers, mostly zeros because of the black background. Um, and we have some output data, which is uh, a one hot encoded vector of classes, which says that this is a three, for example. Um, so very simply, we uh, can call the, uh, the model that we've built on our data and get an answer. Uh, we can convert that model to TensorFlow um, and also get an answer. The answer will be pretty much identical because it's just doing the same thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of seamless enough that it's hard to even tell if it's uh, really going on, but then you'll feel your GPU heating up if you have one. Um, or equally, we can do things like work with MXNet instead. And that might be handy if, for example, you want to test the MaxNet. MaxNet is faster for some problems in TensorFlow, so you might want to try out MaxNet quickly and see if it runs quicker for your problem. Right, that's a useful thing to be able to do. Uh, I'll show you quickly. Uh, I won't show you the training process because that takes a while, but I'll show you quickly the, uh, some of the tools we have. So within the IDE, Julia has obviously built these very numerical intensive computations that go on for a long time. Um, and so we have some tooling to support that that's very well suited to the kind of things machine learning does as well. So for example, we can annotate a for loop uh, with this app progress annotation. And what that will do is that will cause the IDE to show uh, the progress as we go through. Unfortunately, quite small on here, but you can hopefully see down here, we're showing you know, how far are we through a given epoch, uh, how far are we through the training process as a whole, we've got half an hour left, whatever it is. Um, so that's a really helpful feature and eventually that will expand to kind of allow you to cancel training processes halfway through and inspect what's going on, that kind of thing. So yeah, how would we implement in the fine layer? Well, I showed you that it's very simple. It's just implemented as an x times w plus b. Uh, we can write it with Julia notation, very mathematical. Uh, we can use uh, Greek symbols, right? Um, so no kind of tf.matmol or anything like that. We're able to use the notation we're used to. Uh, and very simple, this immediately become something that uh, we can instantiate. So we have a weight matrix and a bias. We put that into the affine layer, uh, which now has that 
weight matrix inside as a parameter. We make some dummy data, uh, we call it, and we get some output. Uh, in a real network, we want some kind of activation to squeeze this between 0 and 1. So we just try calling the sigmoid function and see what happens. OK, now that's between 0 and 1, right? Equally, uh, run on TensorFlow, uh, completely trivial to do. So again, like, uh, what's the key difference from uh, building a TensorFlow graph as opposed to like, running Julia code on TensorFlow? Well, let me show you what the kind of debugging workflow looks like if we're using this. So I define a uh, slightly more complex layer. Uh, it's like a two-layer perceptron. So we have a first layer and a second. Uh, we, have, we call the first, then we activate, then we call the second, then we softmax. Um, so we can instantiate and convert that to TensorFlow and then run it. And we have a shape error. Um, we have a shape error because we were expecting 21 uh, uh, inputs when we got 20, right? So that's a fairly obvious thing. Often it's much less obvious, and I'm sure if you've tried to use this stuff, you will have felt this, the pain of kind of finding these things. Um, what happens in TensorFlow uh, is you, that you get an error like this, uh, which you probably recognize. Uh, it's saying the error happened in this node. Now, as long as you've kind of scrupulously gone through your node, your graph of a 1,000 nodes, and named each one and memorized the names of all of them, this is totally fine. Uh, if not, then you have an issue trying to find where your bug is. So this does something interesting, which is despite the fact that no Julia code is run here, it's all run on TensorFlow and on GPU, whatever, uh, it gives us a Julia stack trace pointing back to the point in our code uh, where the error has happened. So it actually highlights the lines as well. That's standard with all errors. Uh, we can click on TOP and see, oops, let's open a new file. Uh, we can click there and it'll take us to here and that says, OK, it ha the, the error came from our second uh, in a fine instance here, right? We can click on there, and it'll take us up here and say, OK, it happened in the map bowl in the second define layer. So we've kind of been able to drill down and find the error very, very quickly. Um, even better, uh, if that's not enough, uh, Julia has a debugger, which also works in the IDE. So we can step through this. Uh, we see our input here. Uh, we can step into the affine layer and see what's going on. Uh, we can see our weight matrix being multiplied by our input. And step through that. And we're done there. Back to the TLP. OK, well, now we've got an output from the first one. Let's see what the sigmoid function does. Scaling between 0 and 1. OK, great. So this is a very intuitive way to kind of see what your network is actually doing. Um, and if you, you can use plotting while you're doing this and set up the kind of visualizations that we've seen earlier today, um, but not as a special case, just as part of the way the IDE works, right? Step through again, step in, and we found our problem, which is a map model between two matrices that aren't size compatible, so they don't make sense to multiply together. So this, we think, will be a, a, a big help in kind of debugging the more complex models that you have. I'll show you something else. Uh, so here's a recurrent model uh, based on Anjay Kapathy's uh, recurrent neural networks uh, demo, uh, which takes a character at a time as input from a text data set, like a Shakespeare play, and tries to predict the next character using uh, its state that it's built up. And so we train this character by character, and we can teach it to uh, produce text which has that kind of style. Uh, so it's not similar to the style transfer we saw early on, but something like that uh, for, for text. Um, how many people here have worked with recurrent networks before? OK, a few hands. So uh, this is something that's kind of not usually a first class feature within most uh, deep learning libraries, but it's something that we've paid a lot of attention to in Flux. So uh, as you can see, like use, the basic usage is like Keras. Again, you just pop a LSTM in there. You statically unroll if you want to, things like that. Uh, the interesting thing here is actually the way that this LSTM itself is defined. Um, so this is the mathematical definition uh, of the LSTM, right? 
And it doesn't matter too much. Like You have to memorize this. But you can see there's, uh, we're using this notation for multiplying the weight matrix by the input, by the states. Uh, we're using addition of vectors. We're using sigmoid function. And uh, most importantly, we're using this t of minus 1 function to say, don't use the current value of c, because it's not defined yet. Use the value of c from the last time we ran the network. And that's great. That's like a very mathematical notation. But no uh, existing deep learning framework can handle this kind of notation. right? You have to do unrolling, or you have to do a, something else that's very unwieldy. Uh, and usually it takes you know, a, good, a good couple hundred lines to implement. Uh, in Flux, inside the standard library, we have this. And we have a notation for recurrent networks, which, as you can see, looks almost exactly like the mathematical equations we just looked at. You can virtually copy and paste it from the paper. And so this file contains uh, three different LS, uh, recurrent network implementations instead of just the one that you'd normally find if you look up in you know, the Keras source code or something. So that's very powerful. And if you want to, again, like the, the core takeaway is if you want to do something custom, it's very, very easy. Um, say you want a bidirectional recurrent network, right? Uh, you want to take the values of y, not from the previous time step, but from the next time step, right? Um, well, that's as simple as changing this to plus 1 instead of minus 1. Uh, there's no crazy hacks going on here to, to achieve that kind of thing. So uh, so finally, uh, I'll go over a couple of the case studies that we have. Um, So yeah, there's. I, can't, I mean, an obvious question is this point. This is all well and good, but kind of who's who's using this, right? Who's actually being successful with this already? Um, and so we have a bunch of people who are doing that. Uh, Julia gets a lot of usage both uh, within academia and within industry. Uh, we estimate we have about a quarter of a million uh, users at this point, and kind of doubling every uh, nine months or so. Not yet, you know, quite a household name for programmers, but certainly getting there as we go along. So case study number one. Uh, this. Image is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which um, has produced about uh, well a few hundred terabytes of astronomical data from the sky. Um, now this here is actually a very very small sketch section of the sky, maybe a minute of arc or something like that. These little dots here, if you look closely, are not stars. This here is a star. These are all galaxies. Uh, and if you can see it, then then you can see that you know. Ones like this are horizontal and a bit yellow, and there's ones up here which are kind of spiraling and red and that kind of thing. Uh, there's something right here, which I'm not sure, but it looks a lot to me like a black hole. Um, if you're familiar with it, the, uh, a black hole is heavy enough to actually bend the space time around it. And the light coming past it will be bent as if you, know, you put a lens there. So it's called gravitational lensing. And we get this warped view of the sky behind. So we can't see black holes because they're pitch black. Um, so by definition, we can't get any photons from them. But we can kind of infer their presence from this kind of image. So that's kind of the core takeaway here, is actually using kind of the features of this image to infer things. Right? That's a core machine learning problem. And so there's a project called Celeste uh, at the University of B uh, California, Berkeley, which is doing exactly this, and they're doing it in Julia. So they have built uh, a huge graphical model, which goes all the way from um, from you know, what's the probability of a given object being in the sky to what kind of distribution of photons does that emit to what's the Poisson distribution of photons hitting the camera's lens. Right? And they sweep back through that model, and they go, then go from photons to, uh, to stars and galaxies in the sky using variational inference, uh, as was discussed earlier today. So this is one of the biggest graphical models ever run in a scientific context. Uh, it's huge. Um, and I'm going to be a bit vague about the numbers because uh, they're hoping to publish this. But the, the gist of it is that um, this was run on one of the world's biggest supercomputers, uh, hundreds of thousands of cores, uh, millions of threads. And they processed all of this data, this you know, 10 years of sky survey data in 15 minutes. So that's kind of nuts. And it's complete Julia code. Julia threading, Julia uh, 
data structures and operations and all that stuff, right? There's no framework that would let you do this, that would let you run your code on a supercomputer like this, or that could solve this problem at this scale. They had to write all of this stuff from scratch, apart from a bunch of things that they could reuse from the community, like reverse diff, right? So we have these tools like auto diff, which are very generic, so they can be used for this kind of project as well as for deep learning. And it's all kind of very, uh, it all mixes together well. This is open source, amazingly. So you can check this out and you can like run it on your laptop. Uh, probably not as quickly, but you know, if you want to try it, then give it a go, right? Um, lastly, I'll show you this. So this is another project out of Berkeley. They, uh, they love Julia, apparently. Um, so this is an autonomous race car. Um, the brain of this race car is entirely inside the car. There's no remote control server or anything like that. Uh, and it's entirely running Julia. So it's using uh, a library for mathematical optimization called Jump, which is one of the areas where we're state of the art because people have worked on this stuff for a while. Um, and it's using that to drive itself and park itself up in a, in a tiny parking slot. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, lastly, I will uh, mention the Julia Computing website. Um, if you want to find out more about this, there's a Julia Lang website as well, obviously Wikipedia and so on. This has all the case studies. And uh, if you're more interested in like, the industry applications, there's loads of industry stuff, uh, big companies who are using Julia currently for, to rewrite their analytics and things like that, um, as well as Julia Pro, which has the IDE in it. Uh, and this, like, while some of this stuff is more plans we have, all of the demos I've shown today, if anything, they're like an old version of, uh, of Flux. So all of that stuff works, and you can download it and run it today if you want. Um, it's not kind of like some hand-wavy demo that I've just put together. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all I have. So any questions? Yes, thanks. Uh, cool features, man. Um, Thank you. The, um, one of the features from Julia is, I believe, that there's a JIT, right? So you have a function, you can declare types, and that's the main speed up. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an other lovely trick in Python called Numba mm -hmm. uh, that also sort of does this. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I was doing some performance tests with some very simple for loops, mm -hmm. and I saw that Numba was a little bit ahead in this space. Is uh, I'm not sort of declaring a competition here, uh, but uh, what, what is the main difference between Numba and what Julia does internally? OK, throwing down the gauntlet, are we? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no, not, so, not my intention. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a completely fair question, right? And of course, if a number is looking good, why would you, you know, that's, that's the obvious choice if you're using Python, right? right. Um, so what, so uh, there are a lot of JIT compilers like, uh, like JavaScript's V8 engine, which watch your code running and then try to kind of optimize it after the fact. I believe number is of that kind. Uh, Julia is slightly different in that it's actually more like a very lazy ahead of time compiler. So it waits, it waits until you call the function to compile, but then it does the whole compilation up front um, using the information it has. So that kind of leads to a bit of a difference. Um, and on top of that, there are a lot of kind of uh, language features that are designed for kind of, uh, so you have types and objects which are designed to such that you can put, you can define say a complex number type and put it in an array, and it will be compatible with the C uh, version of that type, and it will be uh, um, it will be fast as well, right? So control over memory layout is something that comes up again and again when people are doing these big computations, even beyond like the micro benchmarks on for loops and things like that. Um, on top of that, it's worth like numbers an amazing effort. Don't get me wrong, um, but it's worth mentioning that uh, a lot of people have tried to do this kind of thing with Python, so. You have like un the Unladen Swallow uh, project from Google, Piston from Dropbox. Um, these are the guys who made V8 for JavaScript. So if you can make JavaScript fast, then they're the, they're the experts. They're the people to go to, right? But they kind of gave up on those projects because Python is so hard to make fast, um, especially when you come to the C API and interacting with NumPy and stuff like that. Like It's hard to mesh all those things together. So I hope that answers the question, roughly. But I can ask one more small Go addition then. Um, so, so far uh, with playing with Julia, I know it, it is fast, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's lovely and all that. Uh, and on one computer, you can do sort of things that make it speed up. Uh, what, uh, how good is the support nowadays for having multiple computers uh, aid in one computation? Uh, parallelism is really good, yeah. 
So also for multiple machines? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you can, so this is actually built into like the standard library of the language itself. You can uh, like boot up an SSH cluster, have like some list of credentials and say, boot up these machines into a cluster and then you will have them working. In fact, I could show a quick demo. Uh, I'll use the repo because that's a bit easier. So, Let's try doing something really trivial like a bunch of coin tosses. I don't know what will take a long enough time. So that runs, let's try and make it go for about three seconds. Uh, nope, it's too fast. Okay, this is a bit longer. So if we try and sum uh, a tenth of a billion random coin fix, then we'll get about half of a tenth of a billion uh, back. Let's do add prox. And this will simply uh, add two processes because I have two cores on my machine. Actually, it might be a bit more than that because I have hyper-threading, whatever that does. Um, so hopefully, I'm not going to guarantee this, but <laughs> there we go. After the JIT compiling speed up, it, uh, it got down to more or less half the time. So this is, this is multi-process already. This is happening. This is communicating over a socket. Um, so at having this on another server is just it's the same thing, technically. Um, and so that, as you can see, is pretty trivial to do. Hi, um, thank you. It's really, really interesting talk, uh, particularly around sort of the design trade-offs. Um, my question is around, is Julia good for um, processing lots of text rather than numbers and arrays of numbers? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question, um, which I kind of alluded to but didn't really go into enough detail. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of a hard problem generally, but uh, and string support has, wasn't the initial focus, so it's something that's improving over time. Um, but that's starting to get really, really good. So one of... Uh, uh, one of the things we're working is kind of... Uh, and trying to push forward is working with uh, data in Julia uh, data frames, kind of more loose data structures that aren't just matrices. Um, and so this is something one of my colleagues is working on, Chashi Gelder, uh, at Julia Computing, um, which just does CSV reading, right? Uh, which sounds pretty trivial, but CSV reading is um, like an unbelievably horrible problem because everyone does like the commas in different places and like what starts a quote and what ends a quote, what, is, what, what marks a quote in the middle of a string, that kind of thing. That's totally inconsistent between different things. So it's it's a very hard problem, surprisingly. Um, and this is a library which I think uh, in recent times beats Pandas. Uh, and Pandas is written in just in C code, right? So, and it's very well optimized C code that's been written over many years by people who know what they're doing. So that's quite a significant achievement on Chassis' part. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that a beginner in Julia could beat Pandas in, in two days or something because it's just a hard problem to make this kind of thing fast. In general, you have to know uh, that, that's a skill in itself, right? But uh, the fact that it's possible kind of shows where we are at this stage. Is there any more questions? I wonder if you have any examples of, because uh, you seem to be able to bring these demos uh, um, at the tips of your fingers, uh, of its kind of graphical capabilities, like graphing and this kind of stuff. Uh, OK, I'll give that a quick go. <laughs> uh, this, the ID is something I develop, so uh, that means there's like a 50-50 chance that it doesn't work on any given day. But I'll... Uh... <laughs> I don't have the plotting library installed, apparently. Uh, let's see. Maybe we should take another question while I'm just trying to fiddle around with this. I'll see if I can get it working.
while you're fiddling. Uh, I was curious, where did they run this massive Celeste uh, simulation? Which machine? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it should be in the paper, I think. And if it's not in the paper that's released, then I'm not supposed to tell you. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Yeah, sorry, I only know because I used to use the same machine in a past life. Um, they run it on NERSC, which um, is a supercomputing centre that's mostly funded by the Department of Energy in the US, um, but it's based at LBNL, I think, um, and it's used for lots of sort of high performance processing in physics and stuff in the US by academic institutions. Okay, very cool, thank you. Okay, there's no more questions. We're running a bit out of time, but yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I can show you afterwards if you're interested in seeing plotting or whatever. I have to install the library, so it's probably not worth like making you watch that. Uh, so yeah, we can move on to the next speaker. Uh, sorry. Sorry? Just wondering uh, oh, sorry. how powerful uh, Julia is for um, graph computations like graph traverse uh, and minimum path algorithms over extended in memory graph and things like that. So I mean, that's, that's exactly the kind of thing which Julia is really good for in principle because uh, you can define your own data structures and have good memory layout and it's fast, you know, even if you don't, like that's the kind of thing that really can't be done in a language without support for that kind of thing. Um, there's a package called lightgraphs.jl which I can point you to if you find me afterwards, um, which I think is supposed to be pretty good but I haven't tried it that much myself so I don't know what the different trade-offs are there, so, but that's probably the one to look at and see if it's fits what you need. That's great. Thanks for the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>